ik stel voor dat we naar Londen gaan. Ja. Kunnen we zomaar doen naar Londen, naar Quentin Hus. En uh, als hij er is, dan is het misschien een goed idee dat ja, je hem even ik... introduceert. Ja. Kijk. Hi. Hi, Quentin. Quentin. Hello, hi. Hi. Can yes. We yeah. can see you. <laughs> I can see you too. Good, that's, good. that's very good. Ah, uh, Hilgo will introduce yeah. you and then, then we will uh, hear your talk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you're our first online uh, plenary speaker, so we're very uh, honored. And this is a very exciting experiment for us too. Yeah. So you're not the only one. <laughs> Uh, let me introduce you. So uh, you're a clinical associate professor in computational psychiatry at the Division of uh, Psychiatry at the Max Planck Institute at UCL in London. And I think uh, yeah, why we like you very much is that you, uh, apart from this in, in, uh, difficult computational science, you also see patients. So you really work on integration, something that we really want to advocate in our theme. And uh, for instance, one example is that you use computational modeling to really understand why relapse occurs in patients that were previously responding well to antidepressant treatment, and that kind of example. So I think you're a, very, a prime example of um, how we may incorporate computational techniques and analysis in the framework of precision psychiatry. So we're very anxious to hear your talk on that. Thank you. Ah, yes. Yes, please go ahead. The digital floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much indeed. It's, uh, both, uh, it, it's a great honor to be uh, invited to speak to the Netherlands Association for Psychiatry. And I'm very grateful that this can go ahead despite uh, uh, you know, the situation with COVID-19. Um, I am uh, nervous, even though I have run many of these uh, online talks myself. So, okay, so I've been asked to talk about computational tools for precision psychiatry. Before I... Uh, start, I'd like to just disclose that I don't have conflicts or interest and no relevant financial disclosures. The funding is mainly from the Swiss National Science Foundation, the German uh, uh, Deutsche Forschungsgesellschaft and the Molecular Imaging Network in uh, Zurich. Um, so, computational, psychiatry, computational tools for precision psychiatry. Why is it that we want to throw something like maths at something like emotions. Well, the main motivation behind that is function. If we want to understand the symptoms that arise when an organ uh, is ill, we need to take into account what the function of that organ is. For instance, it's hard to understand why shortness of breath uh, arises when you uh, have heart failure, unless you understand that the heart pumps blood, and the main function of the heart is to pump. The main function of the brain is to compute, to uh, assimilate information, to process it, to learn it, and to change how it processes this information as a function of the information it's uh, been exposed to in the past. So how can computation then cause illness? If that's the main function, how can we think about illness arising as a function of computation? And really, there's at least, there's many ways, but at least two fundamental ones. One has to do with errors in inference. And so, you know, a very obvious kind of uh, uh, aspect of that in mental illness we see might be in psychosis, where you misunderstand how, uh, how threatening an environment might be, or the cognitive distortions that we often see in depression or anxiety. And another aspect might have to do with learning, because the brain assimilates information as a function of the information it's been exposed to. It changes how it processes information. That's learning. And so exposure to certain types of information, trauma, uh, maybe certain types of parenting, life events, can change the way you process information, can change uh, what you believe about the learning. And these interact profoundly. So roughly speaking, that, that that's... The idea is to address these using uh, uh, computational tools because these are computational functions. Okay, so today I'd like to focus uh, mainly on theory-driven computational psychiatry. So there are, there's a very prominent aspect of computational psychiatry that has to do with machine learning, with artificial intelligence and big data. And today I will focus more on the other side, where we try to use mathematical uh, models to understand the computational functions the brain uh, 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 supports and how they go awry in mental illness. 
I'd like to divide, roughly speaking, we can devise, uh, the, 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 the divide the approaches that are being taken into three types of approaches. On the one hand, there's work looking at dynamics. So this is uh, uh, viewing the brain as a dynamical system. So most obviously, uh, individual cells are dynamical system and give rise to action potentials. But we can think of symptoms as dy dynamical systems, and we can think of networks as dynamical systems. The second approach uh, focuses on inference. So trying to, to, to kind of fill in the gaps between the stimuli that we, that, that between the sensory information that, that, that we're presented with and finding out what the latent structure is behind that. And the third approach focuses on learning. How do we take information and change what we do in the future based on that information? So I'd like to mainly focus on inference and learning uh, and, and, and we'll present two, two examples uh, uh, from, of research from my lab. So first, I'd like to start with learning. So imagine you're starting to play chess. Now chess is a complicated game. So there are many different uh, uh, figures. You have, you have pawns, you have kings and queens. And so one way you can uh, go about trying to play chess is that you, uh, one strategy you can you employ is that you learn the rules and then think. You think, well, what happens if I move this and my opponent moves that and, and I move that? And if you think through all possible combinations, you can find the winning combination, the winning move. But obviously that's very hard. That's model-based decision-making or goal-directed decision-making, where you understand the rules and use the rules to derive what is a good uh, 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 thing to do. An alternative is that you watch lots of uh, games of chess and you play it a lot and figure out what works and then just repeat what works in a particular situation. And indeed, chess masters uh, have particular strategies that they start with initially, opening games, etc. And we might call that habits. When you do something because it worked well in the past, not necessarily because you want the consequences of the action in the moment. Strikingly, neuroscience of the past two decades has shown that the brain uh, implements a particular neural link signals that we need to uh, 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 acquire this uh, uh, habit. So if we recall from the dopamine neurons of the midbrain, this is classical work by Wolfram Schultz and others, we see that early on in training, there's no response to a stimulus, but there is a response to the reward that comes after the stimulus. But later on in learning, these dopamine neurons respond to the onset of the stimulus, but they no longer respond to the reward. And the theory that explains this behavior is that of reward prediction errors. And it turns out that these reward prediction errors are very powerful. They can help us uh, do choose actions that are good in the long term that are good not just because they immediately lead to reward, but because they lead to reward and bring us in a state that then leads to further rewards in the future. As such, these theories have allowed us to understand how a particular uh, neural circuit, how particular neurons implement a particular algorithm that solves one of the key problems we face. And so they allow us to now relate changes at the implementation to uh, cognitive behavioral changes that uh, may be observing, that we can observe in mental illness. In particular, dopamine has long been related to addiction. So as dopamine is now related both to learning and to addiction, this has raised questions about how dopamine's role in, in addiction might be related to its role in learning. And I'd like to just describe a little bit of work we've done on this, on this, on this, on this question. So this starts with, a, with, an, with an observation in uh, a, 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 a very standard uh, procedure, which is that of uh, uh, conditioned uh, 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 conditioning. So here, so, uh, uh, rats see a, uh, a, a light, which is followed after a few moments by a pellet being delivered over here in the gold box. Can you see my, I, uh, I hope you can see my uh, uh, pointer. Um, and some rats in the top here will come to go to the light and kind of hang out by the light until they hear the, 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 the pellet drop in the box. Whereas other rats here at the bottom, they will see the light and go straight to the goal box. Now, strikingly, if we record dopamine neurons in these two animals, it turns out that 
that these animals that go to the light, they show these standard prediction error signals. So their dopamine signals increase in response to the light and decrease in, in response to the, to, the, to the cue, to the outcome. Whereas the, the responses of the dopamine neurons of these animals don't change at all over time. Strikingly, you can uh, uh, give these animals uh, group and fixol, a dopamine antagonist, and you can abolish learning in these animals. Whereas you don't affect learning if you, if you interfere with dopamine in these animals. So that means that these two animals learn from the same environment, from the same information in different way using different neural substrates. Strikingly, these are just predictions, were these less so. So we tried to replicate that in humans. We had a similar paradigm in the scanner where people were shown condition stimuli and three seconds later, they were shown money on the other side of the screen. We used goal tracking to look at whether they uh, continued looking at these stimulus or whether they switched and looked at this, the place where the, the, the goal, the, the, the stimulus was going to appear. And now we used computational model to try and disentangle what exactly these people learn. So on the one hand, you can learn a model and that relies on something uh, called state prediction errors. On the other hand, you can learn these habits and that relies on a signal called reward, these reward prediction errors. And strikingly, what we find is that some individuals, those that go and look at where the, 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 the coin is going to appear, they use state prediction errors, and we see that in their intraparietal sulcus. Whereas the sign trackers that look at the CS, at the, at the signal, at the light, um, they show a reward prediction error, and the other groups don't show the signal. So we see the same dissociation of learning signals in different people in humans. So that means that different individuals have the same experience, but acquire different statistics of the world. They build different world models and draw different inferences about what they do. So that means that computation models allow us to quantifiably relate how neurobiological variation relates to individual differences in cognitive uh, in, in, in learning. Okay, so then I'd like to move to a second example, which is more clinically applied and was already alluded to in the very generous introduction I was given. And so that relates to antidepressant discontinuation. So we all know that antidepressants are effective for the treatment of major depressive disorder. They are, however, also strikingly effective at preventing relapses. This is a meta-analysis looking at the relapse rates uh, uh, when people who have responded to antidepressants are taken off the antidepressant and continued on placebo. And what you see is that over the period of a year, around 40% relapse when they continued on placebo compared to 16% on who are continued on antidepressants. This remains the, the same if you look over two year period, the differences are very large and independent of how long you treat or whether you treat for one or two months up to remission or a bit longer. So taking somebody off an antidepressant puts him, at him or her at high risk of relapse. Unfortunately, we don't know who is going to relapse and why. Because if you look over here, there's about a third of people who are not going to relapse, even if you take them off antidepressants. So it would be good to know who can we safely take off antidepressants and who not. So we ran a study together with Henrik Walter at the Charité, where we recruited people who had remitted on antidepressants. We gave them a task, we took them off antidepressants, and we looked at who uh, went on to relapse. And I'd like to tell you just about one measure that we acquired, which is a very, very simple task, where you repeatedly have to choose whether to uh, emit 20 button presses to get one point, or 100 button presses to get a few more points on different trials, three, four, five, six, or seven uh, button presses. So really, this asks the question of how much effort are you willing to invest for a couple more points? Right? And so when you choose that, then you have to press the button here, you have to press, press the button 100 times until this balloon uh, pumps up and, 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 and pops and then you get the point. And so when we look at the behavior here, what we find, so what this shows, is it shows for different rewards for the high effort option, how likely are you to choose this high effort option? And we see that patients do choose the high effort options more when it's more rewarding but they do so less 
than the healthy controls, particularly when you don't offer much rewards. Furthermore, the patients here in red take longer than the controls. Those who go on to relapse don't differ in terms of what they choose, but they differ in terms of how long it takes them to make that choice. With patients who relapse, showing a longer decision time before they make the choice. So we built a computation model to try and integrate all of this. And the computation model uh, integrates how long it takes you to make a decision with the decision you, you're going to make. And it works, and it's a drift diffusion model. And the idea behind is that you accumulate evidence towards one or the other option, and this accumulation over takes time. The faster you accumulate, the faster your reaction time, and the stronger your tendency to choose one option over the other. So here, for instance, you might slowly accumulate evidence for the harder option, and a bit faster for this easy option. It turns out that when we fit these models to the data, we have to incorporate this additional process whereby it seems like when patients with depression make a decision to go for the hard option, they have a double take, change their mind, and still go for the easy option. So without that option, so here in red uh, solid, I show the data, and in, 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 in the dotted line, I show the, the, the basic model. Without the switch process, we cannot capture the pattern of decision times uh, in, in, in the data. Whereas if we include this switch, we can capture uh, the pattern. Now, having built this, we can now ask whether we can use this to help us make the decision of who we can safely take off an antidepressant or not. So what is the clinical utility of this? And so when we use this, we look at whether we can predict uh, uh, who is going to relapse, and it turns out that we can better than chance. And it was a two-site study and when we use the, the, the data, uh, the, the, basically the data from one side to predict what's going to happen in the other side, we find that we can also predict uh, whether people are going to relapse in the other side, which was not used in any way to inform the analysis or the, the uh, models. Now, I don't have time to go over it, but a combination of different computation measures may actually have jointly sufficient precision to bring us towards computational use. So unfortunately, I'm running a little bit over, so uh, I will go over this quickly. So computation models are very powerful because they allow us to test complex hypotheses about latent variables and processes. They really force us to make the assumptions explicit, and they provide tools for thoroughly assessing these uh, hypotheses. And the key word here is holistically. When we build these generative models, we ask how well do they explain the entire data set as opposed to just one part of the data. There are substantial uh, challenges facing computational psychiatry. They particularly uh, are around the issue of psychometrics and about understanding how to deal in a structured manner with self-report. So, um, I would argue that computational approaches are becoming increasingly important for clinicians. Um, there is a thriving international community. If you are interested, I would, I would like to point out uh, that we run a two-weekly uh, uh, online seminar that anybody can join. It's on www.cmod4mh.com, and there are many computational uh, courses uh, around the world, for instance, the Zurich Computer Center. So with that, I'd like to thank the two people who have mainly uh, done these analyses, so that's Isabel Bergian on the relapse uh, data for depression, and Daniel Schaar on the analysis of the decision-making uh, data, and my collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Quentin. Who's, um, so so two, a two-weekly seminar, that's what you present. What? So approximately every two weeks, there yeah. is a, uh, a, a, a talk by, uh, by people from the field nice. on uh, issues in computational psychiatry. Okay, yeah, yeah well, you will find that on that website. So thank you very much. Um, Ilho here, he was, uh, he was uh, listening to you and we were also reading the questions that are coming in, are entered in, in Slido, an app. So, first question is yours, Ilho. Well, we also have some questions here now, it yeah. just recently came in, but I'll start. So, I think it was a very beautiful talk and it's a very complicating challenge to talk about computational psychiatry for people are not that informed in this field, I think. I think that must be one of your... Do you agree? Do you think that psychiatrists are not that informed? 
<laughs> I think sometimes it's very well informed. Ah. I think computational methods uh, are something that's not part of the standard curriculum in the yeah, education of mean, psychiatrists yeah. or men, men, yeah. men, men, mental health workers gen more generally. And I think, you know, I think they show a lot of promise. And as, I di as this promise becomes realized, I think they will slowly become more standard uh, part of the curriculum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see. So, did you have interesting slide or questions? Um, or maybe we can yeah. show them to your site. Yeah, uh, can we, people can we? were also uh, asking about the, there's a tiny beep in, in your sound. We, we, we just tried to fix that, but we read your complaints. And also, the PowerPoint is, is handled by the speaker himself in this case. Um, and we try to uh, make a variation of him showing and the PowerPoint. So, just so you know. Yeah. Yes. Shall I? Uh, Read it out loud, please. Yeah. So this is a very interesting and good formulated question, I think. So somebody asked, can you use a questionnaire about general behavior to approximate this test, referring to the latest test I think you showed, in order to get an idea just from clinical history about the kind of approach to heart decisions in patients? So I think wow. referring to the back translation of behavior of your model. So there are uh, 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 attempts to do that in certain situations. And I think uh, so far it is not clear that that always works. So here, for instance, this vacillation about the decision is not something that's easy to uh, measure or to ask uh, uh, through interoception. Reaction times, times it takes you to decide, are not something that's very easy to ask somebody about. No. I think in general, no. Certainly, uh, the kind of decision-making process that we examined in the, in, in, in the first half of the talk, that's not something that people are particularly aware of or would know. And it wouldn't allow us to, 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 to look at the underlying neurobiology. Now, clinically, the question is, can we come up with surrogates, right? Can we just ask a particular question, which will give us this information? Mm -hmm. I think so far, the answer certainly is overall no. In fact, overall, no to an extent, which is one of the main challenges of the field. When we look at the coherence of different task measures, they seem to cohere to a certain extent, and different questionnaires cohere to a certain extent. But the coherence between these two approaches is yet something that we need to improve on and understand better. There are some ways of uh, uh, starting to get at that, which have to do with repeated uh, within individual measures and manipulations. Mm -mm. Um, and that is very much ongoing work at the moment. Yeah. Thank you so much. The final question already for you, sir. So you can pick a last one, a short one that could... Yeah. Um, I think we should stick with the audience. So this is not really a question, but a comment, but I think it's an interesting one. Somebody states the brain does computation between brackets. Um, and he wonders, well, actually that in itself is quite a challenging assumption. Hmm. Is it? It's a bit of a philosoph philosophical debate, I think, but <laughs> yeah. it's one yeah, of these I things... Mean, I you, would, uh, you know, I, I, obviously, if we had an open format, I would like to, you know, challenge uh, and, 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 and ask, you know, what is the alternative? What's the alternative uh, key function that the brain uh, uh, does? Hmm. I think if we think about, you know, what, uh, you know, I think if you look at, for instance, natural language processing models, so you may have heard about GPT-3, which was just released recently. Yeah. This is a natural language model that you can ask questions and it will give you answers uh, to complicated tasks, like you know, translate into French. Um, yeah. you know, so these are uh, computational models that start giving us insight into what it is the brain manages to do. If we do not take a computational approach, it's difficult to understand how the brain is related to the functions it observes. Yeah. Yes. One more short one. Yeah, because I think what I also extract a little bit from the conversation is that people might wonder that we are used to cognitive tests and neuropsychological tests, which are also about information processing, but they are still a different domain than the computational essays. Could you maybe allude a little bit on? whether computational tests will replace or will enhance cognitive thinking and information processing theories? So, so, so I think there is two aspects. So if we take a machine learning type approach, then the idea is that you can take maybe many different types of, of, of data and, and, and you know, uh, look for patterns in the data. And so 
you know, in that sense, these cognitive texts would still be fed into those uh, yeah. uh, data. Right? Similarly, with these computational uh, theory-based approaches, so what we do, we basically still, you know, might still do computational uh, cognitive tests, mm -hmm. right? but we analyze them differently and we extract different types of information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also the cognitive theories motivate different kinds of tasks and tests and assessments. So the general assessment that, you know, you ask somebody to do something in a structured manner is, is going to remain to a certain extent. We have to probe the function of the brain in some structured manner sometimes. Okay. Yeah, very well, clear answer. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so, so much for your insight in this, in this new area or, or developing area. And uh, uh, all much. the best to you. And uh, we'll hope to talk to you live again soon. Okay. okay. So thank you very much indeed for this opportunity yes, and for we the appreciate uh, interesting it. questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.